Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free Microsoft 7680 certification training course on file and folder access. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to look at the requirements from our 7680 exam associated with configuring access to resources. And this particular module in this section is talking about configuring shared resources. So we're going to talk about something called EFS. We're going to look at NTFS permissions and share permissions. I'm going to look at how you can resolve effective permissions issues. We'll look to see exactly how you're able to tell who has permissions to what on your Windows 7 computer. And we'll talk about what the differences are with permissions when you copy files versus move files. EFS stands for Encrypting File System. This is a really nice feature of Windows because it will encrypt files for you at the operating system level. You don't need any third-party software. You don't have to configure your system to work a particular way. It's just built into the operating system as long as you're using NTFS as your file system. If you're using FAT32 as your file system, the encryption capability is not included with that because the NTFS file system is one of the requirements that helps integrate this into the operating system. The way this works is you can have encryption set up for every single user that's on a computer. So some people who are running on one account will encrypt with their special encryption key. Someone running in a different account will use a completely different encryption key. This is important. That way, everybody who's logging into a computer can keep their information private. One of the things that's important about this is this has nothing to do with permissions, per se. It encrypts files. Somebody may have permission to access a file, but may find that the file itself is encrypted. So so although they can access the file, they can't understand a thing about what's inside of that file. So it's a nice part about having that encryption there. When you're working with encryption, one of the challenges you have is what happens if you lose the key? Inside of op the operating system that we have here, Windows 7 is handling all of that encryption chore behind the scenes. The end users really never see any special certificates or encryption keys. It's all invisible to the end user, very seamless, which is what you want. The problem, however, is that if a user happens to forget their login, they no longer can get into their account. Well, therefore, they also can no longer access the encryption and decryption keys necessary to access the files and be able to read what's inside of them. You can't simply change access for a user, have them get back into their account, and have access to the keys. It will all be different at that point. So one of the things that's very important is that you back up those certificates prior to any changes or any problems occurring. And you do that by creating something called a recovery agent that allows you to recover these files later on. And you can do that by using this command cipher slash r colon and the file name that you would like to use to create that recovery agent. Let's look at how we might encrypt files in the operating system and how we can run that cipher command to make sure we don't lose any of these files that we've already encrypted. On this Windows 7 desktop, we're logged in as Daniel Jackson. And you can see in his documents library, there are archived mission reports, gate diagnostic reports. There's some other folders that are here. And you'll notice one of them is green. That's because I've already gone in here. If I right mouse click and choose Properties, one of the options under the Advanced button right there in the Properties view is to encrypt the contents to secure the data. So we have already turned that on. And when we turn that on, it changes changes the color in our file manager and any view we would see of that folder so that we can see that that is encrypted. What's nice about that is because we're encrypting all of the contents of this folder, if we add additional contents to this folder, well, then we're going to be in a position where everything gets encrypted. So it's automatic. Once we set it on the folder, everything underneath it will automatically be encrypted. Let's use that Cypher command now to back up this EFS key and make sure that it's available for us. I'm going to simply open a command prompt here. And we can see in our user directory, if we just type Cypher, you can see that it gives us information about how things are set for this particular Cypher. And we can move to our Documents folder. And there's all the documents we have there. If I run the Cypher command again, you'll see that one of these, which is the Gate Diagnostics Report, has an E next to it, which means those will be encrypted. The use will be unencrypted. And we can now get better feedback on what we want to do with this. If we do Cypher and just 
with a slash question mark, you'll be able to see all of the things that you can do. There's a lot with the Cypher commands. We can look at how we're using the encryption, the EFS capabilities. What we're going to do is use the R option here. And you can see that generates an EFS recovery key and certificate. And that writes it to something called a PFX file. We're going to specify that PFX file by typing Cypher and a slash R colon. And we'll call this our EFS recovery. Uh, uh, we'll just put EFS recovery. And it'll automatically put a PFX. And it says, type in the password to protect your PFX file. Obviously, you don't want somebody getting their hands on this and decrypting all of your files. So let's give it a password. And it says, retype to confirm. And it looks like I got it right, because it's now creating the certificate and the PFX file. And if I look in my documents folder, there's the EFS recovery CER and EFS recovery.pfx. And those you'll want to put somewhere safe. If you ever need to recover those files, for some reason, you've had to reset your account. And now that you're back in, you're going to want to, to get access back to those encrypted files. You're going to need those keys. And that will help you unencrypt or decrypt the files that are there so that you can then have access to those again. One of the challenges you have when working in a very distributed environment are all of these different rights and permissions that a user might have. If you think about it, there are different places to allow different accesses to files in the Windows operating system. You have an NTFS file that you've got. It's on your hard drive. There are rights and permissions associated with that file. You may, for instance, on your NTFS partition, to name a file and have that file set to read only. And when you set it that way, you're setting it in the file system of the computer. Should anybody ever show up to your computer and log on to that local machine, you're going to use those rights and permissions to grant access to those particular files. But you also have in your Windows 7 operating system and other Windows operating systems these share files, these share permissions. You can create folders or shares that people can use across the network to access files that are on your computer. And you can set up different permissions for people who have shared access to your computer that are different than the permissions that they have with an NTFS partition. So this can sometimes, if you don't keep it straight, get a little bit confusing as to exactly what permissions apply and what permissions don't. But if you separate them out and you follow some basic steps about how these files are located and how they are shared on your computer, it's really not that hard to follow. If you wanted to change either your NTFS partitions uh, or your NTFS permissions or your share permissions, you can do that right from the properties of the folders. There's a sharing tab and there's a security tab. The sharing tab is to set your network shares. The security tab is to set your NTFS permissions on your computer. You can also do this from the command line. NTFS has a command called ICACLS. And that stands for your Integrity Control Access Control List. That allows you to change NTFS permissions right there at the command line. And if you wanted to change how things are configured with a share, you use the net share command. We've done that in a previous video. Let's dive into more of this then. Let's go to our Windows 7 desktop and look and see how NTFS permissions would be set and share permissions would be set. Here we are back on our Windows 7 desktop. And I went right back to the Documents library because I want to look at the differences between the NTFS permissions and the share permissions. If I right mouse click and choose Properties, you'll see the Sharing tab. And that gives me information on how I can configure sharing across the network. And I have my Security tab, which indicates how these files and the security is set up for these files on my local computer. And we can change these security settings. If I wanted to change the NTFS access, let's say Samantha Carter also logged into this computer. But we would like to make certain files available in this folder, this Gate Diagnostics Reports folder, so that she can also have access to these files. And I can see currently, the under the Security tab, the, the system account, the default system account, has access to those files. Daniel Jackson, which is the currently logged in user, has access, obviously, to full control for these files. And if you are an administrator on this computer, this is Atlantis Lab PC computer, and you're under the administrator 
reader's login, then you also have access to these files. Well, we would like to add additional access. Let's say we'd like to provide Samantha Carter with access to this folder. I'm going to click the Edit command. And you'll see she's not listed in here currently. So I'm going to click the Add button. And it brings up that default account information, that selection dialog box that you'll get if you're on a Windows domain. And what I'd like to do, you can see that it's pointing right to my SGC domain. I'm going to type in just her, her name. Uh, Carter, there we go. And I'm going to click Check Names. And it's going to access and say, yes, Samantha Carter has a log on in this domain. And I'm simply going to click OK. By default, you can see the permissions for Samantha Carter are not to have full control and not to modify. Samantha can read and execute list folder contents, read but not write. Well, let's say for this particular folder, we would like to grant her access to write that information. So I'm going to add that option right in the Allow piece and click OK. Now you can see Samantha Carter has now been added to this list. And you can see if I click on that, you can see the rights that we just applied just for Samantha Carter. So that's it. That's your NTFS permissions. We've now allowed Samantha, if she gets to this computer and goes to logs on locally on this computer, she'll be able to have that level of access to those files in that folder. In our last video, we talked about share permissions. And we set some share permissions from the command line. In this video, we've talked about NTFS permissions and how they apply. But you'll notice there's a little bit of overlap here. Let's look at how we would determine NTFS and share permissions and how they interoperate with each other. Well, the first thing to keep in mind is NTFS permissions apply to both local and network connections coming in. So it doesn't matter if you're hitting that file, your NTFS permissions will apply to that file. The share permissions is an extra level of permissions that are set if you are accessing that file or folder from across the network. So you're really layering on top of your NTFS per permissions some additional share permissions, but only if you're hitting it from outside of this computer. Now, the most restrictive setting is always going to win. Even if the NTFS permissions would allow you to do anything you would like in a folder, if the share permissions are set up to deny access, then your access will be denied. Same thing vice versa. If your share access allows you complete access to the computer, and yet the NTFS permissions only allow you to read information, then you're only going to be able to read that. It's only going to apply the most restrictive settings. And so you're going to want to look at what is allowed and what is denied, and you'll have to compare both the NTFS and the share permissions to make that determination. There's also a little bit of a difference whether you copy a file or whether you move a file on the same volume. The permissions that you're setting with NTFS are applied based on that file. And if you copy the file, you're essentially creating a new version of that file. And so all of the permissions when you copy it will apply to wherever you copied it to. If you copied it to a folder where everyone has complete access, then everyone will have complete access. If you copied it to a folder where nobody has access, then nobody will have access regardless of what the original permissions were on the file that you copied. Now if you move a file, it's a little bit different. Moving a file simply changes a pointer inside the operating system. So if you have a file that has no access and you move it, it will still have no access. If you have a file that's completely open and you move it, it will still be completely open regardless of what that parent folder really was set for. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you're moving on the same volume, nothing changes. If you're copying on that volume or copying across a separate volume, well, things could change. So you have to keep that in mind when you're working with permissions. There, fortunately, is a built-in tool that's in our, our Properties folder we were looking at that you can look in to see effective permissions of a file. And that can give you a little bit of information that blends together your NTFS and your share to make it a little bit easier to manage. Let's have a look at how we can test these effective permissions on our network. I'm going to go back to that Gate Diagnostics Reports. I'm going to click the Properties. And one of the options under the Properties under your Security option is an Advanced button right here at the bottom. That brings up a whole new set of advanced security settings just for this folder. And you can see there is a tab here called effective permissions. And you can see this list displays permissions that will be granted to the selected group or user based solely on the permissions granted directly through group membership. So that helps you a little bit when you start understanding who has access to this and who doesn't. So let's choose a particular user. Let's choose Samantha Carter. 
We'll find her in the domain and add her to this list. And it will show for this Gate Diagnostics Report folder all of the access associated with Samantha Carter. We provided her with right access. She has read permission. She cannot delete subfolders and files or delete things. And she does not have full control of that. Let's try another user. Uh, let's do one uh, that is Jack O'Neill. And let me check that name. There's Jack O'Neill. You can see Jack O'Neill has no access to this information because he was not added either with the share or the NTFS piece. And so that effective permissions gives you a way to quickly type in a user or a group and see how that user or group would have access to the particular area that you've looked at in those properties. We can also change permissions at the command line. So let's start up a command line here with CMD and hit Enter. And I'm going to move into my Documents folder so that we can see the folder that I'd like to change, which is the Gate Diagnostics Reports folder. I want to run the command that is the Integrity Control Access Control List, ICACL. And that ICACL's command, if I just hit Enter, there's a lot here. You can really have a lot of access right to the NTFS permissions. I'll scroll all the way up to the top here so you can see it. You can do these changes to files, to folders, set permissions. And you can change it in different ways. You can specify, if I move down here, you can specify exactly the permissions that you'd like to have, like read and execute, which is Rx, and maybe write which is W, or no ac access or full access. You've got different permissions that you can set here, and also a set of specific rights associated with it and inheritance. So things that you'd normally would be able to do right there in the GUI, you can also do at the command line. What I'd like to do is run that ICACLS command, and I want to specify that reports folder. So that's my, my gate diagnostics reports. And I'm going to use the grant command to grant access to Tilk. And I'm going to specify for Tilk that Tilk gets F, full access to that folder. And I'm going to hit Enter. And it says it has successfully processed one file. It failed processing on zero files. So let's see what that really changed. Let's move back and have a look and right mouse click and look at our properties and move to our Security tab. And you can see Tilk has been added. Notice, though, that his permissions are special permissions. I can see these special permissions. If I hit the Advanced tab, there's Tilk and his his permission is special because it is not inherited. It's to this folder only. And if I have a look at them, he has, I'll double click, you can see full access to this. And the reason it's special is because it's applied just to this folder only. So it's a little bit of customization that we've done because I didn't specify all the things that normally we'd be specified automatically in the graphical front end. I simply said full access. And it did not interpret that as full access to this folder, subfolders, and all files underneath. It said just full access to this folder only. I would have to specify that at the command line if I meant more than that. So when you're working in the GUI, a lot of things are done for you automatically, and a lot of assumptions are made. You don't have those same assumptions at the command line. So if you're using that ICACLS command, just keep that in mind when you're setting permissions. Let's review some of the things from this video. Our first question is, which command line utility allows you to configure NTFS permissions? If you recall, we were working right at the command line, and we used the ICACLS or ICACLS command to do that. Our next question, what happens to the NTFS permissions of a file that you move? Let's say we're moving a file on the same volume from one place to another. Because we're simply changing the pointer of that file, it retains exactly the original permissions, regardless of the permissions of the files or folders connected with it wherever we're moving it to. So if you're moving, nothing changes. If you're copying, well, then we're going to take whatever permissions are of where we're copying things to. What is an important item to back up if you need to recover EFS encrypted files? That encrypting file system, very, very useful. But if you happen to lose access to your account, then you've also lost the ability to decrypt those files. So in order to decrypt those files, you're going to need an EFS recovery agent. And you do that by using the Cypher command right there at the command line. 
Well, that covers the things that we needed to know for this module. We have now been able to look at how we encrypt those files and recover those files if we're using the encrypting file system. We've looked into NTFS permissions, both configuring those permissions in the graphical interface and at the command line. We've looked at how we can look at effective permissions for any user that's local on our computer or in our domain. And we've also looked at the differences in our NTFS permissions when we copied files versus move files. If you'd like to watch any of our absolutely free Microsoft videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards or send me a message, you can visit our website at professormesser.com.